We've just heard that the sort of beginning, local beginning of complexity is the elements of a system react to the pattern the elements together create. That's in predicativity. So we already have that term sorted out. What I want to do today is to talk about such relationships between processes. So things in complexity, we always talk about the importance of process and the importance of how the processes link together in a pattern of interactions. But we don't have a language to really talk about processes in themselves and about this relationality. And what I, this is all I want to do today is to introduce you to a way of talking about process and talking about patterns of interacting processes. And because, as you've just heard, I mean, this idea of reflexive relationships lies at the heart of complexity. And this is extremely important because all complex, complex, complexly organized processes have particular impredicative structures. And the whole lecture is just to try and explain what I mean by that. So, let's start. <laughs> Probably the most important set of tools you have in the house and every day for everyday use. Right? Without these, I mean, the thing is the most important. So, I'm going to use this as a starting point to try and explain process. So, this is a typical process that utilizes a set of tools, in this case, a knife and a fork, to cut up a piece of steak. That's a process, and I'm using a particular, let's call it a graph theoretical form, a, good, a diagram in order to, to link the elements of this process together. So we can say there's a set of tools that act on the stake, then to give us a piece of, or a set of cut up pieces of the stake. It sounds trivial, but I'm going somewhere, don't worry. <laughs> in fact, this is an example of a very general formal sort of structure, where you say a function acts on something, A, to give you B. That's extremely general. It's the heart of a type of mathematics. I'm going to sort of link the two as I go through. Of course, the set of tools doesn't have to only cut up steaks. You can cut up different things, like potatoes into chips. So, that set of function, that, that function can act on elements of a set. So we can say if the set A contains A1, A2, A3, until infinity, and set B contains B1, B2, then we can describe the two functions separately. So tools act on A to give us A1 to give us B1 and A2 to give us B2. So, in fact, F acts, this is the general definition, F acts on a set, elements of a set to give us elements of a set B. That's mathematical definition. But the set of tools can be used for different purposes. So I can use the tools to cut, I can use them to eat, and I can use them, or at least one of them, to scratch my back. Yeah? So these are different uses of a particular set of tools, different processes, the cutting process, the eating process, the scratching process. So what is important is that I have to expand my idea of the process in order to type, describe the type of process. So there's me. I choose to use the tools to cut something. Okay? I can also choose to use the tools to eat something or to scratch my back. Right? But that's very important. A choice has to be made in order to, type, to say what type of process it is. We call it in mathematics the parameterization of a function. So I, in fact, not only have one process, I have a set of processes, a set of mappings. And now I want to introduce something that is absolutely at the heart of this business and something that is universally ignored. What's this? More specifically? Open and life. No, it's not. <laughs> It's just two pieces of metal. On their own, what do they do? Absolutely nothing. It's just metal. How do they become a fork and a knife? You have need a pair of hands and the brain behind them in order to 
make them functional, right? This is ignored in mathematics as well. Mathematics just forgets about the mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> this concept of functional entailment, in order for something to become functional, it has to be in an environment that allows it to be functional, an enabling environment, a functional context, or a functionalizing context, if you want to call that. So this is extremely important. Because what we're talking about are processes that need to be in an environment where the process can actually work. So I can put the two pictures together now into one. So this is the functionalizing context. Then we have the non-functional function or tools, and we have the functional tools, functional technology, if you want to call it that. So putting all of this together, there am I. I make a choice in order to cut something. I pick up the tools to make them functional, and I perform the process. Right. This is a much more nuanced way of looking at what process actually is. All processes, at least the ones we're interested in, have, doesn't have to have a human being or, a, or an organism sitting there, but the choice has to be made about how the technology or the, or the, or the tools or the functional element is going to be used. Okay, so that is the first part, just to introduce you to a way of thinking about process. Now a detour. Going way back, our two philosophers, how many philosophers in the room? We have to go back to Aristotle to see how we can now develop a language which, which to describe that process that we've just delineated. And Aristotle was the guy who first thought, how do we answer questions of why something? And he said, well, answer to a wise question is because. And he had four, way of say, four ways of saying because. They're now called Aristotelian causes, but they're not causes in the way that we think about causality. In the, in the sense of Hume, where one thing causes something else, one thing now causes something else in the future. These are because. These are explanatory factors. We want to explain why something. So, say for any artifact X, which is why X is an Aristotelian question, you have to ask what is it made out of, X? What makes X in the sense of what produces it? What makes X in the sense of what, <coughs> what is it to be an X? And then what is X made for, purpose or function? So these are the four causes, material, efficient, formal, and final. The names that are used for these causes. Efficient is, which is going to be the most important for our discussion. It's a bit of a difficult term, but just think of it. Something, if you have an artifact, something or somebody has to make it. And it's that that is the efficient cause. So let us ask that now for our cut-up steak. We have to ask what is it made out of, what makes it, what makes it in the sense of what it is to be, and what is it made for. So the material, efficient, formal, final cause. The material cause of the cut-up steak is the whole steak, obviously. That's where it comes from. You have to have the whole steak and then cut it up to give you the effect, the final uh, cause. Efficient cause will be the cook with the knife and the fork, having made the choice to use to cut it. So the choice, the cook's choice to cut it is the formal cause. And the final cause, of course, the whole process was to, to have steak that you can eat, huh, to be eaten. So that is the Aristotelian explanation of why cut up steak. And Aristotle claimed that that was the full explanation. You have to have all four answers if you want to fully explain what the cut-up state actually is, why it is there. Why did I do this? Again, you might ask, why the hell did I go back to Aristotle? Well, and this is where my genealogy comes from, there was an absolutely genius theoretical biologist called Robert Rosen, who's been universally ignored. Why, I don't know. Even in the complexity world, it is something that, that is unexplainable. He was one of the great complexity theorists. He said, I'm oh, sorry, I just wanted to, because the cut-up steak is a rather difficult one, why David? Because of the marble, because of Michelangelo, his deficient cause. There was some plan in Michelangelo's head, which is the formal cause, the design of, 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 my, of, of David, and then some aesthetic pleasure fulfilling a commission that might have been the final cause, the purpose of David. So what Robert Rosen realized 
because he developed the formalism basically that I've, or, or he used a mathematical formalism to develop this idea of process that I've just described. He realized that Aristotle's becauses map perfectly onto the mappings that I've shown you now. And so we have a language to talk about those mappings. So there's our mapping, and if we have to map the Aristotelian becauses onto that mapping, it's very simple. We have the efficient and formal cause working together as the agent that cuts up the steak. So the steak is the material cause, and the cut up is the effect or the fine, actually the final cause of all the other things. I'm not going to go, go into final cause too much. The efficient, formal, non-functional one yeah, is formalized or is functionalized by the context in which it occurs, and of course then the cut is the choice the parameterization of the, of the knife and the fork uh, to become a cutting instrument. So, so the becauses match perfectly with this. And that gave Rosen a way of talking about process and how processes are related to each other. So that's basically now the language part. This is the language we can use to talk about process and now how processes are related to each other. So what Rosen said is that you can take any organization, any system, consists of components. You can think of a component as receiving inputs from the system and from the environment and also giving outputs to the system and the environment. You don't actually have to define the system in order to do this. You can just think about the component. So there we have now a way of showing the mapping. This is the... the sort of formal mathematical way of doing it. In the mathematics, it's called category theory. So you've been actually been doing category theory up to now. You know it, but you did. But this is a much more useful way of showing the same thing, it's a, this graph theoretical diagram of a component mapping. And as I said, Rosen realized, of course, that you could use these ideas of efficient and formal cause working, acting on material cause to give you an effect. So now, we have in our hands a tool that we can use to start thinking about how processes are related to each other, how they interact, the patterns in which they interact. Here is a typical one, like a factory. There's input, say raw materials coming into the factory. There's a set of machinery, F, that acts on the, on, on the, on the raw material to give us an intermediate set of, of products, B, and then there's another machine that acts on that to give us C, and so on. So it's like a... a for food a month, what you call it a conveyor belt, right? It's a linear path of material causation. Immediately we can give a name to it because what we have here, how does this thing make a, does it make a light somewhere? How? Nathan, you don't think you need this thing. No, forget about it. A is the material cause for B, B is the material cause for C, C is the material cause for D. So it's a linear path of material causation. The important thing is the efficient causes sit outside. They must be given in order to make this process happen. F, G, H. You can have systems where the end product is, is identical to the beginning product, so you have a cycle inside the system. Cycle of... And this would be a closed path of material causation. Again, the efficient causes sit on the outside. You can think about the functional entailment of our linear path of, of, of causation, yeah? of material causation. So somewhere, F, G, H has to be in an environment that allows them to be functional. And that would be alpha, beta, and gamma. So you have this hierarchical system of entailment. And you can go further and say, okay, where does alpha, beta, and gamma, what entails them? You can have a, another set of, of causes up there, efficient causes. Of course, this leads to an infinite regress. And the question is, how do you close that infinite regress in order to have a functioning system, an autonomous system? But all I want to show you here is that you can now use this depiction of a process and the way that, this, that they are put together in a pattern yeah, to try and understand what's happening and understand the, the pattern itself. So here comes the important bit now. It is possible 
and this is the impredicative bit, for the two black dots to be the same thing. So that you have a cycle like this. This would be a, a double hierarchy and a triple hierarchy. Gives you this type of cycle. Gives you this type of cycle. So the big difference between what I've talk, been talking about up to now and this is that all the efficient causes, the dotted lines, are now part of the cycle. They don't sit on the outside. So this cycle produces its own efficient causes. Okay? Are you with me still? And it is this type of cycle that is impredicative and lies at the heart of, of complex systems. Because this is, this is the type of cycle, exactly what Brian was describing in his elements of a system are co-created. They, they react in a way that, that they co-create each other. The difference is that between the two cycles is that material causation is closed, but the efficient forces sit on the outside. And efficient causation, when you have a cycle close to efficient causation, they all sit on the inside. Such a cycle we call a hierarchical cycle. It's created from a, hi a hierarchy folding in on itself in order to form this cycle close to efficient causation. So F causes G and G causes F in terms of efficient causation. And this is self-referential, reflexive, whatever you want to call it, and that is impredicative. Now, I can say it's impredicative. What, it, what does the word impredicative mean? mean? It means that things are defined in terms of themselves. So somewhere in the definition of X is X itself. So it's self-referential, the definition. And I could, how much time do I still have, Rika? Huh? Good Lord. Right. I don't think too fast. But uh, I thought this, this was something that you would all follow. There's our mapping. Our first mapping. F acts on A to give us G, and G acts, acts on B to give us F. A is an element of a set A, or set capital A, and G is an element of a set, set at set X. The same there, B, element of big B, set F, element of set Y. Now, this is important. G is a mapping and it must be a mapping of the things that map B into Y. And F must be a mapping of the set that maps A into X. So I've got a definition for X and I've got a definition for Y up, up there and I can now replace the Y here with that definition and I can replace the X there with this definition. And I get this when I do the replacing. And you can see that x is defined in terms of itself, and y is defined in terms of itself. And that makes it impredicative. So mathematically, it's also impredicative. They can exist. Uh, Russell, Frege, these guys, they were all arguing about banning, or they wanted to ban impredicativity from mathematics. It's impossible. Gödel showed that. So it's mathematically quite kosher to talk about impredicativity. So, Rosen claimed that, and this is his take on complexity, that a complex system contains at least one closed path of efficient causation. Not all efficient causes have to be in the cycle. It just has to contain such a cycle. But, and this is for me as a biologist, the thing that interested me, he said that if all the efficient causes are inside hierarchical cycles, the complex system is an organism. You are such a system. You had breakfast today. What did, happens to the breakfast? What does that mean? It gets broken down into smaller bits. Proteins get broken down into amino acids, nucleic acids, nucleotides, fatty acids. Of fats into lipids. So then what? Let's say you have glucose. What happens to the glucose? If it was a car and I put petrol in it, what happens to the petrol? It gets burnt. Yeah, it gets oxidized and immediately transferred into chemical energy. That's not what happens to your food. 
So the petrol comes in, it gets burnt to carbon dioxide and water, and there we go. What happens to your food is it becomes you. It is, you are created from fragile components, yeah? And you have to survive, persist, longer than the lifetimes of all of these fragile components. So somewhere, you must make yourself, and that's what you're doing. As you're sitting here, you are making yourself all the time because everything is, is fragile. In a year's time, probably about 98% of the atoms in your body now will be, will be gone, will be replaced by new ones. Yet your mom still recognizes you, huh? Well, they, mostly. <laughs> you get a bit older in a year. But you are basically a system that is persistent with a constant flow through of matter, but you retain that functional organization that allows you to make yourself a clo closed path of efficient causation. This is what, of course, this brought me into, the, into this whole idea, and I wanted to know how does it work? Because Robert Rosen, although he was a biologist, could never figure out how the cell actually does this, how these processes in the cell form this cycle of efficient causation. He had a model, but the model works mathematically, it doesn't work biologically. And so I asked myself, and this is a bit of biology that I have to go through now because this is, as I said, what brought me into this. Oh, before I do that, just for interest, the Ross Ackoff is a, is a big name in, in, in complexity theory as well, and he classified systems in three, three ways. He said, well, you have a deterministic system, and he did it in terms of purposes. He says, such a system has no purpose of its own, and the parts have no purposes of its own. The purpose is from outside. I it's me that designs the system. I am the purpose of the system. I, I use the system for a particular purpose that's not inside the system as, as such. He said, an animated system, an organism, you have the components making themselves, yeah? so the system has a purpose of its own, and that is to make itself, but the parts have no purposes of, them, of their own. Right. And then he said a higher level of organization is a social system, which looks a little bit like the animated system, except that the parts themselves have their own life and their own purpose. Uh, and that, of course, in societies, that's where the complexity comes from as well, is that each, each of you... It's not a rational agent, necessarily. Yeah? I confront you with the same problem. You all have different takes on that, on how to solve the problem. <laughs> Matches very nicely. This would be a system which is close to material causation. That would be close to efficient causation. And this would be also close to efficient causation. But they are cycles that are interacting in such a way that they're closed. So as I said, for me as a biologist, I started out with a cell, and this is a quote from a, a, a paper that Olaf Volkenau and myself wrote. Very poetic. It's not. It, he, it's Olaf that read this, that wrote this. Yeah. I, have, I cannot claim to be the author of the sentence. If an organism is our universe of discourse, the cell is the star we gaze at. In its complexity and functionality, even the simplest, tiniest cell dwarfs everything humankind ever has been able to engineer. Nice sentence. Complexity, functionality. Again, those two words. And this biocomplexity, of course, is then the most difficult type of complexity to try and understand. So there's our cell. It faces a number of core challenges. I'm not going to go into this. But the first one is important because that's part of the definition of autopoiesis. Autopoiesis is also this idea of self-production, but also the idea of self-bounding. You, you must distinguish yourself as, as a system from the rest of the environment. Allow the environment please, to interact with you, but there, there's an, in, a, an interior milieu in which things happen inside the system. Lots of other things, but it's this one that is of interest now. This idea of self-fabrication, of making itself, producing itself. Not reproducing, not making babies or something like that. Of just making, persisting as, as an entity. So my question was, the cell forms a hierarchical cycle. How does it do it? <coughs> the question that Rosen couldn't answer. So I'm not going to go into much biology, but this is, the, this is the machinery of the cell, the agents, the things that actually do something. Transporters that transport things over membranes, enzymes that catalyze reactions, and you have a whole set of them, transcription enzymes, metabolic enzymes, and so on. Ribosomes, which are the machines that make proteins, and all of these things, all of them are proteins. So the ribosomes are the things that make these proteins. 
and then various other things, transporters, for nutrients and for electric lights. But the important point is the machinery makes this. And a polypeptide is just a string of amino acids. It is non-functional. In order to become functional, it has to fold up into a compli complicated three-dimensional structure in which there is an area called the active site that recognizes something and acts on it, substrate to product, say, for an enzyme. So the question is, how do these polypeptides get functionalized? Remember now the idea of functional entailment? What is the functional, where does it come from? Well, it comes from the fact that the intracellular milieu, the chemical environment within the cell, is of a very specific nature, which is carefully controlled, and which is different from outside the cell. I'm not going to go into the details, but all, this, all the iron concentrations are different. There's a different pH, there's a different ionic strength, everything. And that particular milieu is the only one that allows these ones to become functional. If you change the milieu, the enzymes lose their function. Right? So the intracellular milieu is an efficient cause. It causes something to become functional. The question is, where does the intercellular milieu come from? It must be maintained by something. And basically, it is already maintained by what is inside the cell. And that's where the elements produce the elements, yeah? or react to each other in so in that the one causes the other. So here we have the, the absolutely important concept of the functionalizing context, which is central to, must be central to any discussion of complex systems, which is usually completely ignored. So again, I can now build up a little picture with my diagrams. There's the, 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 the most of what I saw, the, the, the production of the polypeptides is just now one mapping, lumping everything together in one mapping. They get functionalized by the milieu, the M, the intracellular milieu, and the intracellular milieu is created by something that already exists. So, these are just inclusion functions. Don't worry too much about this, just that I can use my language to talk, and formal language, to talk about what's happening inside the cell. So I've got three mappings, and they fit together in a way that closes it up to efficient causation, which you can see if you chase an element through the whole system. Then you can clearly see the hierarchical cycle. All the dotted lines are inside the cycle. So for me personally, that was now very interesting to be able to explain how the cell actually forms the biochemistry that we know about, how it forms such a hierarchical cycle. In fact, I can expand that to include all the important processes in the cell, to show how DNA, which is the formal cause of the cell, is used in order to create all these things. I'm going to go into that. But what can we learn from this? And this is, for me, the sort of important thing for, for people who think about complexity. What can we learn? What lessons can we learn from the cell? So the basic unit, this is a nice quote from Bailey in Sociology and New Systems Theory. The basic unit of social systems theory is the society, not the individual. So he looks at the whole. But we, of course, that's not completely right. You have to think of both. The individual creates the society. The society creates the individual in a sense. But I like the second part. Everything that is used by the system is produced by the system itself. Right? And this applies to elements, processes, boundaries, other structures. And at last but not least, to the unity of the system itself. And if you start thinking about systems in such a way, let's talk about an organization, say a business or a society. In order for that to be self-sustaining and persistent, it has structure in terms of the elements, and they are related in a particular entailment structure that we can now describe with using our language. The structure must become functional, and in order to become functional, it, ne it needs an internal environment, a context within the organization that acts on the structure to make it functional. So you have this sort of closed cycle of efficient causation. Again, with this being something that is usually ignored, which is absolutely crucial to the idea of persistence of such an organization. Because what? The structure consists of fragile components. People leave the system or they die. Yeah. So you have a flow through. It's open to material causation. So it's open in the sense of privacy, open system. But in order for, that, for this whole thing to work, what comes in 
must become part of the system. So you enter the system, you leave the system. With institutional memory and training, the structure can become You can train them up to be possibly functional, but within the, within the system, there must be an environment that allows them to become functional. I don't know whether you've ever been in this organization where there is a toxic culture inside the organization. Yeah, that easily happens. And what does it mean? It means that you can't do your job properly, right? You have to have an enabling context within the organization in order to make it work. So you need that to close the cycle of efficient formation. So Parsons Luhmann talked about the persistence of functional roles. The persistence is only, is only possible if it happens. So that maintains that, and that ensures that the structure is functional. So we can use this insights from, from erosion and the idea of closure to efficient formation and creativity to try and analyze and, 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 and understand how a system such as a society or an organization works. But now we have a language with which we can do it. So, to conclude, to persist in the face of fragile components, a system needs both an enabling external environment. If the cell doesn't have food, it can't sustain itself. Obviously, that's important. But it also needs an enabling internal context that allows its components processes to be functional. Autonomy requires the entailment structure of the system processes to be arranged in a hierarchical cycle, which makes it complex in, in Rosen's terms. And such closure can only come about if the components of the system produce the internal context that makes them functional. Again, going back to, to Brian's quote, which is, this is in the sense of paraphrasing of that. So, all I can do is, is, is give you the language. If you want to use it, you can. But you can also use the insights from using such a language to try and understand complex systems. And perhaps, I mean, why do we talk about complexity? If, if everything always went fine, we wouldn't worry about complex systems. But it's because the, our way of looking at things is not correct, right. and things do break down, we do need the language of complexity. And this is one of the languages that we can use to try and understand what happens inside such a complex system. Thank you very much. What about social change? What is, how would you develop a strict theory of change from, from your perspective? Okay, so that's a very good question because in a sense what I've been explaining is a theory of persistence. Mm. Uh, a theory of persistence of a system that has fragile components and needs to produce itself all the time. There are two ways of doing this, and the cell again has the answer. The one is if you have a sort of an institutional memory, a culture within the system, yeah, very broad term, that can be changed through time by, by interaction, such as nat natural selection happens in evolution. Yeah? So you have a system that, that let's, say, let's say we have an electoral system that doesn't seem to work that well at the moment. And we compare it to another electoral system that works well. Yeah? And we change our institutional memory or the way we do things in order to become better. That's a sort of, I mean, there's not really competition between, between cultures. Maybe there is, but sort of evolution change. But the other one is to have a system which is, which is plastic inside. So you, you are plastic inside. You can adapt within genome, your genomic constraints. It's not a straitjacket. You, your body can do many things. It can repair itself. If you cut yourself, it can repair it. I mean, it sort of knows what to do. A bacterial cell, if you take it from one food source to another, it changes its internal structure in order to be able to use the new food. So there are two ways of change. The one is by evolution, you change through competition, if you want to call it that. The other is adaptive change within the constraints of what your system can do. And that's all possible within such a close to efficient causation system. But you need, that, I said that was the four challenges that the organism faced. Two of them were how to adapt to changes in the environment, and you can do that through natural selection, and how to adapt to changes through, uh, how can you immediately adapt to the existing system through, through adaptive restructuring of the system itself, according to, to, to what is possible. And in you, the DNA says what's possible. 
tells you which proteins you can make. And so now you may not need this. It, if you think of, you start with a cell that's undifferentiated, and then it differentiates into different 250 something cell types in your body, and each of them has a different structure, enzyme structure inside. They're not, they have the same DNA, but not the same proteins, right? And so within those constraints, you can adapt. I don't know whether that answers your question, but so that would, there's a built-in theory of change there if you if you expand your story a bit. Thank you, Nancy. We have another question here. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> um, lovely talk. Thank you. Um, I have this feeling that lurking inside what you're saying is somehow a definition of life. Yes. Would you expand? <laughs> so, biology has, has, has a number of, of really important questions that are not productive in the sense they don't give you money if you apply for grants. One of them is what is life? What makes life different from non-life? Yeah? And how does life change over time? Those are the two big questions. One is evolutionary theory, the other one has never been answered. So Rosen, that was the, his driving questions. What distinguishes life from non-life? What the quick from the dead? And his answer, and I absolutely agree with it, is that there are many answers, but, but they are ranked in a hierarchy. And right at the bottom is this question of how the, uh, the system has this basic problem that all the molecules that you're made of are fragile. You can't get past that point. So the first big problem you have to solve is how to be able to have a system that produces that. Once you have that, you can adapt, you can reproduce, you can evolve, you can do all the other things that usually are part of the definitions of life. But yes, I would say this is the basic definition of life. It is a system that can create its own components and so fabricate itself. So all organisms can do that, and all non-living systems cannot do that. Right, Jean, would you like to come to the front and then we um, open up the floor for some more questions for both of them? Just um, ask, yeah, we want direct, at least direct questions, not comments. Try and try to keep it as questions. Jeannie wants some water. Let me just... Jeannie wants some water. I'm, I'm okay, thank you. Yeah. Professor Walker. Well, I would actually like a discussion <laughs> between um, our two speakers about... <laughs> Sorry, I, I sense a, a different emphasis between the two speak, between the two understandings of complexity, and I think your what you were talking about was much more about the emergence and also less bounded. Um, whereas what Gabby's um, talked is more about you had a sense of the cell, um, as a, and it was bounded, even though there was an external because I think it was bounded in some way. So. I, I would just like for the two of you to debate what you would see as the difference between those two. That's a lovely question. I, I, I was thinking, that's what I was thinking about. So, so the, the, the notion of, of self regulation that, that, that Yanni was talking about, I, I, would, um, I would certainly um, agree with. And, and also the notion of the kind of creeping forward from that, that position in the way that, that Yanni described about how. How culture can kind of um, uh, change. So, so that is um, that is embedded within um, the, the notion I was talking about of patterning. Patterning is a kind of self-regulating uh, process um, that, that kind of coheres something and allows us to talk about it in some sense as a thing or with some stability. Um, what, what I think I'm um, placing more emphasis on, just uh, just to pick up on that, is is so, so Yanni was, was perfectly describing for me how you make um, an organisation functional by paying um, attention to its, its cohering culture. So that's a kind of practice. It, it's, there's a sense in which culture can emerge and it can be a bad culture. But to give, to give you an example, I worked with a, a, a global um, organisation very well known for its sustainability. Um, and one of the things it seems to have in its culture that goes right back to its beginnings 
was the notion that, that sustainability is kind of embedded in its culture. And when I prodded that and asked people in all different parts of the organisation, you got a sense of it was real rather than greenwash. Um, so one of, one of the issues for that organisation is how does it pre preserve that, that kind of sustainability focused culture and yet become more efficient, more effective in terms of, of the external world. So, so, so I, I agree with that. Where I would perhaps be um, theorising more or thinking about more is um, an organisation, if, if, if it starts to think of itself, and some do as a kind of closed system, and pays attention pre predominantly to its internal structure, as indeed this, this organisation was, was, every conversation I had seemed to be about power or structure or, or things going on inside. You know, the fact is that there are, there's competition, you know, there's, there's relationships with suppliers, there's changing cultures, there's changing markets. Um, so, for example, I, I had one comment made by the person who ran Asia for this uh, country, uh, company, who said, um, uh, well, well, all our products are, um, are middle class products and we don't really have a middle class in Asia. I don't know whether that's true, but that's what he said. And I'm going, well, what are you doing then? You know, you're, you're so busy refining yourself internally and looking inside, you're, you're forgetting you know, that, that actually there's, there's a big world and the world of shocks, you know, the world of, of geopolitical change, you know, the world of climate change, the, the world of, of increasing competition, it, it, it can completely destabilize um, this the, a kind of a, an autopoetic view. And we had that conversation yeah. um, last week, didn't yeah. we? So, so I would add that in to, to this, but I would also not, not disagree with this process of kind of... Um, the need for co-creating, the kind of reflexive processes that makes things uh, cohere and um, and survive is, is is true. But it's a both and for me, more. But there's an interesting point, <coughs> the difference between the cell and, say, a society or an organization is that components of the cell don't know that they're inside the cell. That's why there has to be a physical boundary created in order to, to, to separate it from, from the rest of the world. But in a society, the components know whether they belong or not, and they create by that the boundary. It's not a physical boundary, but it's a what, 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 what we'd call it. But it's a belonging boundary. You know that you belong to a particular set of people or so, and that creates a sort of a boundary. It's per, it's permeable, like the cells. The cells boundary is also permeable. But I think that's the difference. There's Ekoff's organism and his society. The society is, you know, these are are agents in themselves that can decide whether I belong to a system or not. The cells components can't do that. Your organization didn't learn that one lesson from the cell, which is that you must be able to sense what happens in the environment and react to it. Adapt your structure in order to fit yeah. with the environment, and the cell does that beautifully. Yeah. So you need both. You need this internal idea, and you need to be able to sense what happens outside and adapt accordingly, if you can. Yeah, thanks very much for two interesting talks. I suppose my, my comment is it relates to the previous question, um, which crystallizes for me around the word structure and how you both use and don't use structure, the concept of structure. Uh, Jean used it much less. Uh, and uh, obviously it was very central Yanni's talk, but I'm, when I hear structure as a social scientist, I get really, really worried, and I will talk about that a little bit later, uh, because structure has been, in social science, has become an extremely serious obstacle for thinking about change, uh, and in particular, if you're interested in power relationships, and coming back to your comment, uh, Yanni, in a social system, people are conscious of what they are part of. And for a social scientist, the question is, who is conscious of what and part of what? And who defines that? And how do you contest it in order to redefine or reimagine an alternative uh, to the, the dominant conception of the so-called structure? So structure has become uh, somewhat of a, of a, of a kind of uh, uh, obstacle thinking about radical change. And I'd just be interested in your reflections <coughs> on the work and 
and whether it is whether it is, it is still useful. I mean, in the way, I mean, you use structure uh, to describe open systems uh, or a, 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 a complex of open systems interacting with one another. It's, a, it's that's a far more useful friendly term to me than calling it structure. Okay, so, so I mean, I'm not aware of the fact that structures now become a problematic term in social science, but I take, I take it that's, that's true. So it's, to get rid of the word then, don't use it. It's a pattern of relationships. Yeah? And it's a neutral term in that sense. It just, it's, it's the way things interact with each other. It's, and that has a structure. I mean, you can have a, a, a linear path of material causation. That is one sort of entailment structure, if you want to call it. I, I like the word entailment structure. Or you can have a, a cycle or whatever, and these are different patterns of interactions that one has to understand what the implications are if you have them. So, so I, I would be perfectly happy to get rid of the word structure, um, because I don't mean some other fixed set of power relations or anything like that. I just mean generally a pattern of relations. I, think I, I was also thinking I, I, I tended to start to use adjectives more than nouns. So I, I think about systemic or processual yeah, yeah, yeah. rather than process and system. Mm -hmm. So it kind of reminds us uh, that, 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 that if it feels structured, it, it's kind of being both held by relationships and it's temporary. And you know, people always seem surprised when they have this, this very kind of structural view that things collapse. If you look at things like the, there are books written like from great to good and you know, the, the, about the, the wonderful, you know, global organisations, you know, none of which exist now because they, mm -hmm. they, don't, they, they believe their own rhetoric and they, they don't notice the change in the wider environment, like Yanni says, and, and they, they collapse. So I'm kind of uh, with you. And I was thinking even, even like how it lands with me um, kind of emotionally when you say, well, you know whether you belong. And I'm thinking, I spent my life wondering if I belong. You know, <laughs> do I belong here? You know, do I belong at Steers, you know? And, and <laughs> am I really a physicist or am I pretend? You know, those, yeah. those kind of Join questions the club. <laughs> of identity and belonging. I don't know what systems I, I belong to, you know. So, so it kind of reminds me of that in, in, in a way. Uh, and, um, but I don't think we're, we're really in disagreement. But it is, I do think language matters, uh, yeah. you know, about how you, you feel. And there are dominant languages. And, and if, you, if you know you belong, you feel you take it as red, don't you? But uh, for many people who are marginalised by or, or by gender or or, or race or, or whatever, there's a, there's a, there's a much more kind of like, am I really allowed in here? Um, so. I think it's interesting with it, just on this question of structure. If you walk into an organisation and you want to know what the pattern of relationships are, then you're going to the CEO office, CEO's office. What does he do? He shows you an organogram. You know, I'm at the top, and then da 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 da, the power relations. But if you really want to understand the pattern of relations, what do you do? You don't go to the CEO, you go to the secretary. <laughs> and then you know who sleeps with who, and who does this, and who does that, and how do, they, how do things actually work in this organization, right? And that is the pattern of relations that I'm interested in. The real pattern of relations. Not what the CEO tells you in terms of structure. 